In the middle of the night over the Atlantic Ocean, off the coast of Canada, the first officer of Swiss Air 111 detected a faint smell in the cockpit of the McDonnell Douglas MD-11. After a short period of uncertainty, the crew decided to divert the plane to Halifax, Canada. But just 21 minutes later, the massive airliner impacted the ocean just off the coast near Halifax, after declaring Mayday in a distressed tone. What happened to the flight? Today, we are going to find out what one of the most extensive air crash investigations ever discovered. Subscribe if you liked the video. Welcome to Airspace. On September 2nd, 1998, Swiss Air 111 departed New York's John F. Kennedy Airport, headed for Geneva, Switzerland. The seven-year-old McDonnell Douglas MD-11 was piloted into the night by 50-year-old Captain Zimmerman and 36-year-old First Officer Leu. In the cabin, there were 12 cabin attendants and 215 passengers. Just 52 minutes after takeoff, the first officer remarked that he smelled something weird. The crew started to look around, and seconds later, the captain remarked, oh look, probably referencing to something he was seeing, which would probably have been smoke. The first officer then stood up to investigate, but after a brief search concluded that whatever was there before was now no longer visible. The pilots then summoned a the flight attendant to the cockpit and asked her whether she was smelling something unusual. She confirmed and added that there was no smell back in the cabin, but that it was clearly perceptible here on the flight deck. The flight attendant then left the cockpit and the pilots started to working on the problem by consulting their checklists. As they suspected smoke from the air conditioning, they started to work the respective checklist. A minute later, smoke again became visible on the flight deck and the two pilots realized that something was clearly amiss. They decided to divert the plane and to land as soon as possible, declared Pan Pan, which is an urgency message, one step below Mayday, and requested to divert back to Boston, which was 300 miles behind them at the time. The air traffic controller immediately cleared them to Boston, but suggested Halifax as an alternative, which was just 60 miles ahead of them. The crew gladly accepted this suggestion. At this point, the pilots donned their oxygen masks but realized that they would not be able to fly an approach directly into Halifax, since they were still too high and already too close, and required a greater distance to descend. Also, the plane was still over its maximum landing weight, since only about an hour had elapsed since the departure from New York. The crew now considered to jettison the excess fuel to reduce weight, and requested to do so via radio. The first officer was flying the plane at the time, while also handling radio communications, since the captain was busy with the air conditioning smoke checklist. In the meantime, the smoke got thicker and thicker. At 22.23 local time, the checklist directed the captain to switch off the cabin bus switch, which would cut the power to various electrical power appliances in the cabin, such as the galley, the normal cabin lighting and the recirculation fans that help ventilate the cabin. This was done in an attempt to cut power to possibly faulty equipment. This later proved to be a turning point in the sequence of events. Not even half a minute later, the autopilot failed and the plane warned the crew of this fact with a very distinctive oral warning. Autopilot. Multiple systems now started to fail one by one and the pilots urgently declared Mayday and that they were now dumping fuel. In a following radio transmission, they were cut off mid-sentence but the plane continued to fly. Most likely, the fire developing on board ate through the radio cables at that time. In the cockpit, the captain now remarked that he saw something burning and that they had to land as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, more and more instruments on the flight deck started to fail and the first officer had to fly with only the tiny standby instruments. At this time, while the plane was at about 10,000 feet, the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder failed. Five and a half minutes later, the residents of Peggy's Cove, a small town near Halifax, reported hearing a loud thud echoing through the night and silence thereafter. Swiss Air 111 had crashed just off the coast and it was quickly determined that there had been no survivors. After the accident, one of the most extensive and costly air crash investigations of all time started. The Canadian, Swiss and United States Transportation Safety Boards collaborated in the effort. Using several methods, 98% of the wreckage was recovered from the sea floor. This must have been a tremendous effort, since the aircraft broke up into over 2 million pieces that partially settled on the 55 meter deep sea floor or were washed ashore. From the get-go, it was clear that smoke or fire would have been a factor in the crash, so the investigators focused on parts that were showing traces of fire. And sure enough, they found burnt material belonging to the flight deck and the aircraft ceiling, called the attic space, which is a space between the aircraft skin and the cabin interior. 
where the insulation is and a lot of electrical wires are routed. The fact that the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder had failed before the impact made the investigation a lot more complicated. To the amazement of the investigators, they found a lot of burned insulating mats, which was astonishing because these mats were certified to be fire retardant. When they subjected these mats to heat and flames, they were baffled to find out that they burned quite easily and that once ignited they could even spread a fire. Now that they had found the material that had burned, the search for an ignition source began. For that, the investigators rebuilt the cockpit as well as possible, using wreckage parts. They managed to find out that the fire had started in the top right corner of the cockpit, where many wires ran together behind a panel. Next, they examined the 250 kilometers of wire that were installed in the MD-11. Not all wires could be identified, but the culprit was eventually found. A wire of the in-flight entertainment system that had been recently installed was found to have arced. Arcing occurs when voltage is able to bridge an air gap between two conductors. In the case of Swiss Air 111, arcing took likely place between this in-flight entertainment power supply wire and the aircraft structure. This arc then ignited the insulating mats. The cabin recirculation fans provided a rearwards flow of air that sucked the flames further towards the aircraft's tail in the attic space of the MD-11. The smell produced by the burning was likely perceptible on the flight deck, but initially no smoke was seen since it was sucked back into the attic space as well. When the cabin switched off the cabin bus switch, and with that the cabin recirculation fans, the airflow in the attic space reversed since air was now being sucked forward towards the cockpit by the fans used by avionics computers and so on. Now the flames quickly started to engulf the wiring in the overhead panel of the aircraft and also the attic space which led to the failure of several electrical systems and filled the flight deck with smoke quickly. One by one, systems failed and the pilots were eventually left without normal instruments, only with the backup systems and the autopilot warning blaring in the background. It could no longer be switched off, since the connections to the respective switches had most likely melted at this point. In the end, the fire broke through the cockpit ceiling and plastic started to drip down. Burn spots and molten plastic were found on the carpet behind the pilots. In the end, the plane either became uncontrollable or the pilots lost all reference in the dark night over the dark ocean and the plane crashed at half the speed of sound. It disintegrated immediately and all occupants apparently died instantaneously. None of the victims but the pilots showed signs of smoke inhalation, bearing evidence to the fact that the fire was most likely only perceptible on the flight deck. The investigation determined that from the time the first officer smelled the first sign of smoke, there would have not been enough time to make it to any airport. Also, the smoke checklist of the MD-11 at the time did not state clearly enough that signs of smoke immediately warranted the declaration of an emergency situation and that landing should not be unduly delayed. In the aftermath of the event, certification standards for wires, insulating mats and other aircraft components were revised and all insulating mats installed in MD-11 aircraft and other types had to be replaced. Swissair, who had installed the in-flight entertainment system correctly, had originally planned to attract more passengers with the modern installation. The company was in financial trouble at the time, and that only got worse after the crash. After the events of 9-11 in 2001, the company eventually went bankrupt. It was reformed to the now successful Swiss International Airlines. Also, smoke and fire checklists for various aircraft were changed to reflect more prominently that signs of smoke usually prove a significant threat and that a landing should immediately be planned. Also, some checklists were simplified, since they were very complex. The smoke checklist of the MD-11 would have taken 20 to 30 minutes to complete, time the crew of Swiss Air 111 did not have. Memorials were created in Peggy's Cove and the operations center of Swiss Air, remembering the 229 victims of this horrible disaster. That's it for this week's video. For me, this one was very strange to make, since I know many colleagues who were working for Swiss Air at the time, and they have told me a lot about how they felt on that day. Also, every day I go to work, the memorial reminds me that no matter how diligently one may pilot an aircraft, if something very unlikely goes wrong, there might just be nothing one can do. Anyways, if you like my account of the story, please consider to subscribe. See you in the next one.